Uh, greetings from North Carolina and many thanks to the conference organizers for facilitating online participation. We wish we could be there with you. So I am um, speaking on behalf of myself and my co-authors this morning about a study of multimodal communication using multiple approaches, uncovering signal functions in a neotropical katydid. Multimodal communication mediates mating for many animal species. Matoya et al. recently reviewed multimodal communication in courtship. And examples of multimodal courtship displays can be found in birds, mammals, arthropods, and amphibians. For example, male blue-black grass quits include motor and vocal components in their leap displays. Seba short-tailed fruit bats include visual, tactile, and acoustic components in their displays. Male banana fiddler crabs wave their claws, of course, but they also drum by rapidly stridulating the claw. And the small torrent frog produces acoustic calls that are accompanied by visual cues from the vocal sac. So why do animals signal using multiple modalities? Well, some hypotheses focus on signal functions. The idea of multiple messages is that each signal type carries different information, such as signaler identity, quality, or location. More information can be communicated than with a single modality. The idea of redundant signals is that the information in each signal type is the same, enhancing information transfer in noisy or unpredictable environments. Of course, a single animal species may signal in ways that support both of these hypotheses, as shown by Gerard et al. for peacock spiders. Neotropical katydids are ideal for studying multimodal communication, and they're so charismatic. The males of most species use airborne calls to attract females. Calls can also mediate competitive interactions between conspecific males. Many neotropical species also produce substrate-borne tremulations by vertically oscillating their abdomens while perched on a plant. And our focal species, Docidocircus gigliotosi, produces both calls and tremulations. Uh, it's previously been reported that males tremulate spontaneously and that males and females engage in tremulatory duets. And here I'm showing you a populating pair of the focal species. So today I'm going to present a study in two parts. We first examined how Docidocircus uses tremulations. Um, they call, tremulate, and mate on their host plant, which is shown here. It's a large bromelia, Acmea magdalene. And in this study, we placed previously collected males and females on focal plants in the field in different social contexts, and we observed their behavior. And then after characterizing their behavior in this way, we conducted playback experiments to test predictions about call and tremulation functions. So our, um, I want to set up the field experiment first. We know that signal parameters and signaling behaviors and receiver behaviors should differ between the sexes if reproductive investment differs. And in many cases, males should be more likely than females to engage in signaling that's costly or risky. And females, pardon, <clears throat> should often use male signals to locate and distinguish among potential mates. So with this in mind, we hypothesized that males tremulate to attract females and that tremulations facilitate pair formation between males and females, as in some other species. And we predicted that males should signal first um, when solitary to attract females, that tremulation duets involving both sexes should sometimes follow, and that during tremulation duets, katydids should demonstrate vibrotaxis. So our general methods, we conducted both parts of this study at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute on Barrow, Colorado Island in Panama during the winters of 2019 and 2020. And our observations were conducted at night between 8 p.m. and 1 a.m. 
Two microaccelerometers were affixed with wax to the undersides of separate leaves of a focal plant. We used, we alternated among three focal plants in the field. And Katie did behavior was recorded with infrared video and we made continuous focal observations using red light. So we described the communication and mating behavior of Docetocircus in four social contexts, solitary males, solitary females, male-male pairs, and male-female pairs. And to do this, either one or two laboratory-maintained animals were placed on this plant that was relatively isolated from surrounding foliage in the forest. And then Katie did behavior was recorded for 30 minutes unless a pair was interacting. And in this case, observations continued until a Katie did left the plant or copulation was complete. And I'm showing you Alina Iwin, uh, the co-author who conducted the majority of this work. So I'm going to quickly show you because I can, maybe I can. I'm going to quickly show you a couple of examples of the kinds of video we got from this work. So here you can see a male and down below you can't quite see there is a female on this plant and it's going to happen very quickly. The male will tremulate and the female will move. And the females are pretty fast. Now I've muted it um, intentionally because in addition to picking up the tremulation, the plant is also picking up a lot of ambient jungle, um, lowland forest noise, which is quite loud. And in this case, we have a pair. Here's the male, here is the female, and they are going to both tremulate in a duet. There's the male. The male again and the female. Great. Okay, so I'm going to restate our predictions and tell you what we found. Males should signal first to attract females. Indeed, nine out of 10 solitary males called and tremulated, and zero out of 10 solitary females tremulated. So that prediction was supported. Tremulation duets involving both sexes should sometimes follow. Five out of the 15 pairs engaged in tremulation duets. Male tremulation rate increased in the presence of a female and two out of the five male and female pairs that um, had tremulation duets copulated after duetting. So this prediction is also supported. During tremulation duets, katydids should demonstrate vibrotaxis. We are in the process of generating ethograms to represent transitions between the combined behavioral states of the males and the females. So I can't answer this question for you yet based on these data, but I will show you some other data before the end of the talk to address this prediction. I want to highlight that the solitary males called and tremulated and then take us back to the next part of the study. Why do docetocircus signal in multiple modalities? We took a function-focused approach for the second part of our study. Because we wanted to understand signal functions, we examined how receiver behavior, signal parameters, and signaling behavior differed between the sexes in each modality. Our hypotheses were that signals in each modality should provide information to receivers about species and sex, and that they should influence inter- and intrasexual interactions. We have four predictions, bear with me. Uh, first, that signal parameters should differ according to species and sex. Second, that signals produced by conspecifics in each modality should elicit mate-finding behavior from the opposite sex. Third, that responses to opposite sex tremulation should differ between the sexes. This goes back to reproductive investment differences. And fourth, that competing males should signal in response to conspecific but not heterospecific male signals. Okay, methods for this portion. We quantified parameters of male and female tremulations. The calls of Docetocircus gigliotosi were previously described and we know that only males call. And we know um, from this previous work that their calls 
um, the parameters of those calls differ from other species. So calls already uh, potentially provide species and sex information. So we quantified parameters of tremulations, and then we conducted playback experiments in a controlled setting. We measured the responses of male and female um, docidocircus gigliotosi to female or to signals that varied by modality, species, and sex. So the stimuli were played to Katie Dids on one of two similarly sized potted um, bromeliads. And on each bromeliad, two leaves that were each about a meter long were used as the stimulus source and Katie did introduction leaves. And we alternated between plants and leaves for each trial. And it was set up basically the way you see here. We recorded stimuli for male and female conspecifics and also from one other species for playbacks of heterospecific signals. We recorded calls using an ultrasonic microphone and played them from an ultrasonic speaker shown here. And we recorded tremulations using micro accelerometers and we imparted them to leaves using a shaker shown here. And then we calibrated playback amplitudes of both modalities to those of the original recordings. And I'm gonna show you an icon because as we get into these data, it's really helpful for keeping track of things. So on the figures, I'll show you icons like this that indicate what we played and what receiver response is being measured. So here, opposite sex tremulations are being played and you're looking at either male or female behavioral responses. In this case, male calls and tremulations are being played and you're looking at female responses. And male calls and tremulations are being played and you're looking at male responses. Okay, so I'm gonna restate the predictions again to help us keep track. And the first one was, I have to adjust something in my ah, Zoom screen, if I can, maybe I can, there we go. So substrate borne signal parameters differ according to species and sex. Indeed, tremulations do differ by sex in two parameters, peak frequency. You can see that female tremulations on average have a lower peak frequency than males. And also um, female energy is distributed across a greater um, range of frequencies than males. So 90% bandwidth on average is greater for female signals than for male signals. We also saw that receivers appear to distinguish between species via calls and tremulations. Both sexes tremulated more in response to conspecifics. So this first figure, I'm going to show you data from male calls and tremulations that were played to females. So we're looking at female behavior. And you can see that females tremulated only in response to conspecific calls and not many and not too much, but this is actually a novel finding for neotropical katydids. Um, females tremulating in response to male calls has been shown for old world tropical katydids, but not yet for neotropical katydids. We also see that females tremulated more in response to conspecific male tremulations than to heterospecifics or silence. And now if we look at male behavior, we've got, let's look at this figure on the right first. So males tremulated more in response to uh, conspecific female tremulations than to heterospecifics or silence. And male calls, they just are similar across treatments. Males just call, regardless of what is happening. Prediction number two, signals produced by conspecifics in each modality should elicit mate finding behavior from the opposite sex. So some females did exhibit vibrotaxis and um, also they, they not only located the sources of vibrations, but also calls. Five females located the stimulus source, two located the speaker playing the calls, and three located the shaker playing the tremulations. We saw no evidence of vibrotaxis by males. The distances walked by females and males did not differ by signal presence or modality. So here you've got walking distance by females. You've got the treatments, they walk similar distances regardless of treatment for male calls and also for male tremulations. Um, 
We note that they walked shorter distances during heterospecific tremulations than during silence. Prediction three, responses to opposite sex tremulations differ between the sexes. So here we're looking at female behavior again, and females walked longer distance, well, we're looking, sorry, at um, both female and male behavior. Females walked longer distances than males overall. So we've got distance traveled, female shown in white, male shown in gray, and across treatments, females walk farther. And then we also saw that males tremulated more than females. So here we have number of tremulations on the y-axis, males shown in gray, and females shown in white. The fourth prediction was that competing males should signal in response to conspecific male signals. We saw that males tremulated more in response to conspecific calls than to conspecific tremulations, which is interesting and maybe suggestive of a strategy. We did not see other differences among treatments or modalities, even though the mean number of male tremulations in response to conspecific calls was double that in response to heterospecific calls and greater than in silence. Um, we had a smaller sample size for these playbacks of male signals to males just because of time constraints. So we did our best, but the only thing that we pulled out as a difference is that males tremulate more in response to conspecific calls than to conspecific tremulations. So when we put it all together, we see that males tremulate to attract females and tremulations facilitate pair formation. We see that signals in each modality do provide information about sex and species. Um, for calls, this is consistent with other work on Katie did, and um, the tremulation data is very nice. The receivers appear to distinguish between species by tremulations as well. Activities relating to pair formation appear to be partitioned according to sex. Females walk farther, males tremulate more. Why does dosi do circus signal using multiple modalities when we come back to the hypotheses? Our findings mainly support redundant signaling. Both calls and tremulations are species and sex specific. Males produce both signal types spontaneously and females tremulate in response to both signal types. However, our findings might also support multiple messages or at least context specificity. Females tremulated more in response to male tremulations than to calls. And males increased tremulation rate, but not their call rate in response to female tremulations. So maybe both of these findings are driven by, can be explained by selection by eavesdropping predators using a safer signal when a receiver is within active space and on the same substrate. However, Male signals may also provide information about body size or condition, and this remains to be tested. We also saw that males tremulated more in response to conspecific male calls than tremulations, perhaps suggesting a sneaky strategy. I would like to thank um, the administration and staff at Stry and Rachel Page, um, our colleagues in the Terhofstede lab for all of their assistance with this project and funding sources. Thank you.